All right, here we go. Algebra 2, Unit 1, Day 4, Take 27, Vertical and Horizontal Transformations. Today we're going to be talking about the other kinds of transformations that we can perform on functions. In our last lesson, we talked about vertical shifts up and down and horizontal shifts left and right. Today we're going to be adding a few more into the mix, including making our functions steeper, making them wider, flipping them upside down, or flipping them across the y-axis. We're going to go through how each of these happen, um, starting with a review of what causes a transformation to be vertical versus horizontal. Vertical transformations happen outside or after our functions. And so what I mean by that is if we have x squared plus 3, the plus 3 is happening after the x squared part. So it's just applying to these y values here. It's like you take every output, negative 3 squared, you add 3, there's 12. Negative 2 squared is 4, you add 3, and there's 7, and so on and so forth. And you can see the same thing in the graph. To draw a transformed version of this graph, you would just take every single point and you would move it up 3 spaces, up 3 spaces, up three spaces, and so on and so forth, till you have a picture of this graph or what it looks like. The key thing to remember as we go through the rest of this lesson today is that this is a vertical transformation because we did the plus three part after the x squared part. Versus if we stick the plus three inside Right? It's like it's inside the x squared function, so order of operations we would do it first. This is where we get our left and right shifts. The reason that x plus 3 on the inside gives us a shift to the left is because whereas your normal function has its vertex at 0, 0, your new function, I'll do that one in red just so it lines up, your old function has a vertex at 0, 0. Your new function has a vertex at negative 3, 0. So x has to be at negative 3, and every point along with it has to be shifted 3 to the left. I'm just going to do a quick sketch of what this one would look like. 3 to the left, 3 to the left. This function, every x value, it's like it's just behind. It's like it's behind the other one by three spaces um, because it's getting three added to it. So every single x value is going to be negative to cancel that one out. That's why it moves left, or at least every one on the, the ones that I've shown here. So that inside versus outside distinction is going to be really important today. The first thing we're going to talk about is vertical scaling. And so scaling, instead of shifting our function up and down, we're going to pinch it to stretch it or compress it to flatten it and make it wider. Our example, so we're going to work today again with this. This is our normal function, y equals x squared. This is the normal x squared function here. If I change that by making it 3x squared, the 3 happens after the x squared. So it's just take every y value from your old function, multiply it by 3. If x squared is 9, 3x squared is 27. If x squared is 4, 3x squared is 12, and so on. So we're just we're taking the results here and we're multiplying all of them by 3. And if I plotted these points, meaning I plotted 3, sorry, negative 3, 27, negative 2, comma 12, negative 1, comma 3, just plotting all of these points. I can't plot the 27 one, but I can plot negative 2, 12. I can plot negative 1, 3. I can plot 0, 0, 1, 3, 2, 12. What has happened here is that this is a vertical stretch of our function. Our function hasn't been moved up and down. It's like you have your parabola and you're pulling it. You're stretching it so it goes up more steeply. That's a vertical stretch. And that's what's going to happen when you multiply by a number bigger than 1. If, on the other hand, you multiply by a value less than 1, it means you're going to take these outputs, 9, which is negative 3 squared, you multiply it by 1 half, you will have 4.5. So when x is negative 3, the output is only half as much. You're only here 
at 4.5. When x is negative 2, the output is only 2. When x is negative 1, the output's only 1 half. And so we could go ahead, notice the vertex doesn't change. The vertex stays the same uh, because we're not shifting left and right. We're not shifting up and down. We're stretching or compressing. Then we'd have 1, 1 1.5, or sorry, 1 and 0.5, 4 and, or sorry, 2 and 2, and 3 and 4.5, our last points here. And so as you can see, this is basically just a fatter version of our original graph. We call that a vertical compression because it's like you put your hands up and down and you compress this graph. You push on it to make it fatter. So we call that a vertical compression. What you have to watch out for is it's going to look very similar, but there is also something called horizontal scaling. Now horizontal scaling is what happens when the three or whatever number k is, is on the inside of your function. So you do three times x first, then you square it. So looking at this table here, you do negative three times three is negative nine, squared is 81. You do negative two squared is four, sorry, you do three times negative two is negative six, squared is 36. Negative one times three is negative three, squared is nine. So in this case, it's gonna have the effect of same idea, everything's just happening even faster. Like negative 236 is like way up there. Negative one nine is one of the only ones I can draw. Zero, zero, one comma nine, two comma 36 is just way, 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 way. I can barely even draw that one, but you get the idea. It's way, what we call in this case, because it's on the inside, I know this is gonna sound weird, because previously we called that a vertical stretch, we call this one a horizontal compression. A vertical stretch and a horizontal compression are kind of the same thing. Vertical stretch, horizontal compression. This is on the inside, so we're gonna call it a horizontal compression. It's like we're taking that and we're pushing it in on itself to make it skinnier. Likewise, if we had a horizontal stretch, what this is going to look like, instead of a vertical compression, it's going to be a horizontal stretch left and right like we're pulling this function out the reason it's like we're pulling it out is because for each of these inputs and outputs so let's go let's try this one negative 3 squared negative 3 times negative 3 is 9 in our original function so negative 3 9 I'll put a dot right there if we multiply that negative 3 by 1 half first what we would have here is we would have do this in blue, we would have half of negative three, which is negative 1.5 squared, which is positive 2.25. So if we look at the comparison here, that is way lower. That is way lower there. And the same thing's gonna keep happening. Negative two times one half is negative one, squared is one. Negative one times one half, negative 0.5, squared is 0.25. I know this is gonna be symmetrical, so I can just save us a little time by drawing the same thing in the other direction. It's on the inside, so we say horizontal. Horizontal means what can I do like this? Am I compressing it? No, I'm stretching it. I'm stretching that graph out horizontally because the transformation happens on the inside. I know this is gonna sound like drinking from a fire hose, but the one other thing you need to be aware of that can happen here is what if not only can these numbers be smaller or less than one to, uh, to do vertical stretches, uh, vertical compressions to make fatter, you can do all these things and you can make those numbers negative. If you have a negative scaling factor, if you have a negative one, a negative two, a negative five, these are going to cause reflections. They're either going to cause vertical reflections over the x-axis, so from top to bottom or from bottom to top, or they're gonna cause horizontal reflections from left to right or from right to left. Now, to tell the difference between the two, once again, it comes back to this idea of outside versus inside. If I have, so this graph here that's already on the table, this is y equals the square root of x. So like the square root of one is one. The square root of four 
is two. The square root of nine is three. The square root of 16 is four. That's how this graph works. If I stick a negative sign out front, all that's doing is you do the same math. So you say, okay, what's the square root of zero? Zero, zero times negative, it's still zero. There's no difference there. But the square root of one, okay, is one, but then we multiply it by a negative. So we're on the other side of the x-axis. So this is negative one. Square root of four is two, make it negative, negative two. Square root of nine is three, make it negative, negative three. There we go. Square root of 16 is four, make it negative, negative four. If your negative sign is on the outside of the key function, in this case, the parent function is the square root function, it is a vertical reflection over the x-axis, okay? Now, one last tricky thing here is horizontal reflections, and this is the end here. Um, let's say the negative is on the inside of our function. Before we do this, it's worth kind of just thinking about why this graph only goes till zero, why the domain of this function, so I'll do the red domain, the red domain is that x has to be greater, <clears throat> greater than or equal to zero. The reason is you can't take the square root of a negative number. Square root means what thing times itself is what's on the inside. Two times two is four, and negative two times negative two is also four. You cannot get a net, you can't take the square root of a negative number. So that's why this graph stops at zero. And so if I tried to find, right, if I tried to find the square root of negative one, I'm gonna put like, I'm just gonna put an X here. Doesn't exist, it's undefined. Square root of negative four, undefined. Square root of negative nine, undefined. Square root of negative 16, undefined. That's why there's nothing on the left-hand side of this graph. But, and I found a little, the one typo here. Let's say, did it again. Let's say this is the square root of negative x. So you do the negative first. Okay, the square root of negative zero, that's still the square root of zero, that's zero. But the square root of one, which becomes negative, the square root of negative one doesn't exist. The square root of four, negative four doesn't exist. The square root of negative nine doesn't exist. The square root of negative 16 doesn't exist. So the negative x graph, negative square root of x graph isn't going to have anything where x is greater than one. What this graph needs, again, picture what's happening here. When we plug this in, negative one, if we plug it in, negative negative one is positive one, square root is one. Plug in negative four. Negative negative four is positive four, square root is two. So we can see this graph is going to be the exact same thing except it is going to have all of its values, square root of negative, negative nine, square root of nine is three, it is going to be a reflection over the y-axis. Most of the graphs that we've been working with have been symmetrical. So had I taken that absolute value graph and flipped it over the axis, it would have looked exactly the same. So that's why I had to use this square root one to show you one that does actually look different if you flip it over the y-axis. It's pointing in the other direction, and that's going to happen when you have a negative sign on the inside.